Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. Hello and welcome to our second annual Halloween special, Listener's Edition. If you aren't aware, if you haven't heard last year's episode, this is where our listeners send in 500 word flash fiction Halloween theme stories. We had an amazing turnout this year. All together, I think it was over 140 to 150, somewhere in that area, stories. And we have, I think, under 90. I haven't even bothered to count exactly how many we have, um, but we have around 80 to 90 stories that were accepted. And I just want to say a big, big thank you to everyone who submitted. Whether you were accepted or rejected, you are a winner for submitting. <laughs> and you guys all brought me joy no matter what. So thank you so much. This is part one of the Halloween special. Part two will air on Halloween. Same time, 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can get your Halloween thrills on on Halloween as well. This was my secret ambition. My secret goal was to have enough entries in order to make a part two, in order to make a two-parter. <laughs> so that was, that was a little bit of a dream come true. So I wanted to say thank you very much to all of the writers. Thank you to Holly for taking the time out of her very busy schedule to record some of the entries. And a big thank you to um, the other voice on the podcast, which you guys know is the one that everybody wants to read their stories. That's Mark Herman. That is my brother. And he really had way too much to do as it is already, <laughs> but he went ahead and just fit this into an insane schedule. He recorded and edited his own stories, which I really cannot thank him enough um, the fact that he was able to do this while on the road and in hotels and waiting for hotels and on buses editing, you guys really, if, if you can go to any of the social medias, go to the website and comment on the blog, go to the forums and comment on the Halloween episode, um, forum post, and just let him know, you know, from your end, thank you very much for taking the time because he did a lot of work and he's doing it for literally nothing <laughs> just, just because I asked him to. So yeah, um, if you guys appreciate what he has done, uh, find a way to give him a shout out on any of our social media and or our forums and we will pass that along to him. He is not a big fan of social media, so you know, that's, that's the best way to do it. Or you can send us an email at show at alone with invisible people.com. If you are interested in submitting next year, uh, we highly suggest that you take Holly's how to write flash fiction that does not suck course. It is free. It is three weeks. And by the end of it, you should, if you're following the prompts and everything, you should have, I think 10 or 11 flash fiction stories. And, um, yeah, definitely get yourself in the podcast next year. We will leave a link to the course in our show notes, as well as a list alphabetical of every single author and their story, as well as any bylines or social media links or links of any kind, if the author has provided those for us. We will also leave a link to all of the music that I used. We will also leave links to all of the music that I used in all of the different stories. There is a bunch. So if, you, if you're a fan of this work, by the way, it's all one artist. His name is Kevin McLeod, and he has such an amazing portfolio <laughs> that um, I found everything I needed it, with one dude. <laughs> So, you know, this is a, a, a huge thank you to him for, for being so prolific and also having such a wide range. So anyway, enough of my chatter. Let's get on to the Halloween stories. Absolutely, Positively Killer Pizza by Katherine Kistner. Absolutely, Positively Killer Pizza. The best there is. This is Andretti. Our $4 extra-large today-only Halloween special is called The Gino. 
lots of meat, green pepper, and onion. We guarantee delivery in 30 minutes or it's free. May I take your order? Andretti went through the same spiel 66 times in rapid succession without a break. At least a quarter of these orders will be freebies. Not all my drivers showed up for work today. Again. Huh. Just the idea of a freebie hooks my regulars in the calling back daily, and why I'm the top store manager of the company. After closing, Andretti industriously cleaned up until the nightly delivery arrived at 1.30 a.m. He slid into the cooler and went home. Why do they always come so late? When he arrived the next morning, Andretti checked the invoice and instructions. Today's special would be called The Luigi, with meat, black olives, and onion. Easy enough. This joint uses lots of hamburger. Some we use plain, but different spices transform it into counterfeit mild Italian sausage or hot Italian sausage. No truth in our advertising. Our customers don't care, they just want cheap. Andretti cooked the hamburger in four 25-pound batches. Hmm. Yesterday's meat was lean, today's is fatty. Corporate must be having trouble with quality control. Our customers will never notice. As he folded the cooked meat from the pan into the tubs, Andretti noticed that one piece was still conspicuously large, so he fished it out and inspected it closely. His head snapped around as he checked in both directions. What am I going to do? Somebody lost a finger at the meat processing plant. He checked online to see if meat contaminated by a human body part would kill the customers. Nope. Just cook it long enough to kill any parasites. I'm good to go. Hey, Carlo. Andretti here at 13. Sorry to call you private number, but it's urgent. Last night's meat delivery had a finger in it. A whole finger, with bones. Did a meat plant employee lose a finger recently? Jeez, I hope not. But I'll look into it, Andretti. Thanks for calling. Let's make sure nothing like that happens to you again. Creepy. Set that finger aside, and don't tell the other employees just yet. I'll drop by at closing to check it out. As he discarded the meat box while awaiting Carlo, Andretti pried loose a mutilated driver's license wedged in the fold of the box and read the name. His mind lurched and recoiled. No, no, this can't be. Luigi Mancuso was today's Luigi special? A shuffle. He turned abruptly, his face blanched with horror. Carlo! Absolutely, positively killer pizza. The best there is. This is Dante. Our $4 extra large today only after Halloween special is called the Andretti. Lots of meat, mushrooms, and onion. We guarantee delivery in 30 minutes or it's free. May I take your order? To Live Again by Jason Gallagher the darkness was suffocating, or she imagined it would be. She couldn't tell anymore, though the burial still felt recent. She'd guess one or two days? It occurred to her that eternity is a long time to reflect on one's mistakes. Like presuming she didn't need a velvet interior because she didn't have to worry about being comfortable. Ever the penny pincher. Her shoulder blades protested that decision and before long her pelvis and heels complained as well. Yeah, she had regrets. Too bad she can't do anything about being dead. She heard footsteps above her, though how anyone could hear footsteps through six feet of solid dirt was beyond her. Lord, to walk on the earth again, to feel the chill of the night air. She wished she could switch places with the person who walked above her. Suddenly, her world changed. She saw scraggly grass mixed with weeds and brown with drought. She saw headstones, rows upon rows of them, stretching out into the darkness. Fog drifted between them, around her, raising goosebumps on her skin. She wondered if this was the afterlife. As she turned, she saw her own headstone, her name and dates etched in granite. The moon grinned down on her through the passing clouds. She shouted with joy, her voice was a lot deeper than expected. Shocked, she looked down at her hands, which held a shovel. 
They were thick, calloused, with hair on the backs. This hair glowed silver in the moonlight, extending up her forearms to where her plaid sleeves were rolled back. Oh shit! I'm the groundskeeper! The moment she thought that, she felt his soul trying to push back in. It strained her concentration, but she was stronger, and he backed off. Then she heard something. A crunching noise, like the sound of digging. She looked towards her tombstone and saw the earth swell and crumble. The hair on the back of her neck stood on end. Everything inside her screamed to run. In horror, she watched her gnarled hand break through the earth, her diamond engagement ring glinting in the moonlight. Next came her gray curls and lifeless eyes. And then her corpse got to its feet and reached out for her. She opened her mouth, but her new deep voice made no sound. When the dead fingers wrapped around her wrist, she found her muscles and swung the shovel. The blade made a sickening crack as it connected with her former head. The body fell to the ground, neck bent askew. His ghost rose from her corpse, and they looked into each other's eyes. It struck her that she really didn't want his life. She left his body to see what more there could be to the afterlife. He could clean up the mess. The Bundle by Sue Albury In bed, I tossed off the covers again. Nothing was right anymore. My best friend Annie's art therapy group had turned into pictures of flowers, with faces screaming in fear and weeping clay figures showing soldiers shooting students. Annie's boyfriend Stuart came around in the morning as usual. He said a hundred more people were rounded up last night. I'd been up early looking for my contact to get my report out to the BBC. But she wasn't there. I wondered if she'd been taken, or if the world even cared. I also hoped maybe I could make a video cell phone connection to talk about the revolution, but my semi-sexy flowered dress had only elicited a few whistles. The only internet, phone, or TV we had was the approved version. People used to depend on me for truth in the newspaper. Now, I was allowed no voice. The building was occupied by others. I went home and wrote angry poems to add to the pile under the floorboards. Later, I took my guitar out and added a sad melody to a song I wrote when all of this started. I couldn't think of anything else to do with my day. The next week, the general sent guards to my house, and I was asked to go with them. Then, I waited in a hallway all day. I saw a gray column of smoke over what looked like my house, and I was afraid. What do you think of me? The general asked, motioning to show me the ribbons and badges on his chest. I was only a journalist. What did he want to hear? Not the truth. He wouldn't like that. I answered the best I could. I don't know you, General. I only know your actions. He smiled craftily, like he had just cornered the mouse. And what actions do you know about? That you do things to make people fear you. Yes, yes, I do. In front of my house, a truck stopped, and a large red stained bundle with flowered dress material was thrown onto the street, pinned on a scrap of crumpled paper with music and scrawled lyrics to a song. I backed up from the bundle and seemed to watch while Annie rushed into the street. But they promised they wouldn't do this to her, she sobbed as she and Stuart cradled my disjointed body. On Freedom Day every year, there is a special song sung by the entire country. It reminds everyone that liberty must be bought and paid for with blood. It was the anthem to our revolution. In front of the remains of my old residence is a small house-like shrine where there is a charred guitar and fresh flowers. I have stayed in that place and I whisper the story to people who come there. If they listen carefully, they'll hear how I had screamed out the lyrics and the sad little melody over and over as they broke each finger.
Hear Me Callin' by Fenya Harker. Mr. Moore was having a wonderful day. In fact, every day had been wonderful since he had moved here. Fall had painted the leaves crimson red, and the low evening sun made the shadows dance. All he missed were the chats with his neighbor, Mrs. Pumpkin. Although today felt different, as if Mr. Moore had gained weight and he felt homesickness in his bones. His right hand itched while he drowned his precious dahlias. The feeling grew stronger as he walked back to his home. This was his home now. Why would he want to be anywhere else? There were no nasty teenagers and the weather was always just lovely. It started when he had to turn on the lamp to continue reading his book. The fleeting impression of a whisper caught his attention. He peered over his glasses and got back to his book. The next sound came from the kitchen. Someone was speaking in a foreign language. Hello? Mr. Moore put down his book and hesitated. Motionless, he listened into the passing warmth of the day as the well-known shadows inside his house grew longer. The voice appeared again, and this time it was shouting his name. We call you Mr. Moore. Then there was the giggling of female voices. Were those neighborhood teenagers back to play tricks on him? Mr. Moore smashed the book down and followed the dark hall to his kitchen. Nobody was there but the whispers. Do we have to say his name three times or something like that? Oh, I don't know, Kathy. Even after looking around, he found the kitchen empty. He opened the drawer, the oven, and even pulled the plug out of the kitchen sink. The girls' voices grew louder. Tiff, why are we still trying this? Shh, it's been exactly a year since he died, got it? No. A cramp stung Mr. Moore's chest. He felt the pain in his left arm and the sight of his window to the garden flickered. He saw three girls sitting around candles and black lines on the floor, and they called him. An undefinable noise filled his ears, and the pain grew larger and tried to engulf him. Just before he passed out, the world shifted, and he found himself in the dark room together with the girls. Candlelight and a cold breeze made him as dizzy as the pain from his heart attack. Can we give up now, Tiff? Mr. Moore tried to grab a bookshelf, but his hand just went through it. A book fell, and he stumbled back right through the wall. Laying on the ground and panting heavily, he heard the girls from the other room. What was that? Just a book. Mr. Moore felt pain, anger, and sorrow. He was longing for his peaceful work in the garden. Let's go to the Halloween party now, okay? What a horrible day. The first day of an awful eternity. Last Black Cat by Amberlyn Pryor Georgie's ears perked up as two people stopped outside his cage. What's wrong with that cat? The sign says he has flea allergies. <laughs> Looks like mange. They turned away. Georgie put his paw through the bars, but he couldn't reach them. My fur's growing back, he meowed. Georgie was the last black cat in the adoption center. The Halloween special of half-price adoption fees for black cats had succeeded in getting the others adopted, but no one wanted Georgie. Georgie slumped on his bed. His large bulk took up most of the cage's space. Here he is. It was Anne, the adoption counselor. This is Georgie. If you want to take advantage of the Halloween special, then he's your new best friend. The man chuckled. I actually want him to befriend my cat. Does Georgie like other cats? I don't know, but we can find out. Anne opened the door and scooped Georgie up. Georgie's ears flattened at the rough handling, but he kept his claws sheathed. This was his chance to impress an adopter. Anne left Georgie in a small room and then brought in another cat. She was a young tabby. She leaped out of Anne's arms and pranced up to him. Isn't this exciting? She meowed. We're going to be adopted. I never thought someone would actually pick me. Um, well, Georgie trailed off, not sure how to tell her the bad news. My name's Cleo, she said. She blinked slowly, 
her beautiful green eyes mesmerizing. He swallowed. I'm Georgie. How long have you been here? I'm not sure. Last time I saw the sun, it was midsummer. Cleo stretched. It feels good to have room to move around. Georgie hung his head. She'd been stuck here longer than him. She deserved a chance. The adopter entered the room. Cleo ran over and rubbed against his legs. He leaned over and stroked her back. Hello there. You sure are friendly. Georgie retreated to a corner. The adopter found some toys. Cleo leapt at the string and then ran over to Georgie. Come play with us, she meowed. Georgie licked Cleo's forehead where her fur was tussled. It's better if I don't. You go impress the adopter so he'll take you home. She cocked her head. Isn't he going to adopt both of us? Georgie kept silent. The adopter crouched down. He rubbed Georgie behind the ears. It felt good, but Georgie had made up his mind. The adopter would pick Cleo. He unsheathed his claws. Anne entered the room. So, what do you think? I'd like to adopt them both. Georgie blinked, confused. Cleo purred and leaned against him. They get along so well together, I don't want to split them up. That's great, but only Georgie qualifies for the Halloween discount. That's fine. Cleo twitched her tail. What's Halloween? she asked. Georgie shrugged. Don't know, but it's lucky time for black cats. Cleo licked his cheek. I'm feeling pretty lucky myself. The Last Turn by Trevel Swift Dottie tapped her lengthened nails on the steering wheel. The stadies at the checkpoint took their sweet time. Two hunters had caught up to her a few towns back while she was having an episode. She had left a mess. When the trooper reached her, Dottie smiled big for the officer. The Halloween season was in full swing and she was just another woman in a furry costume. The officer gave her and the vehicle a once over, handed back her license and waved her through. She received another vision, hallucination or whatever, of herself as an old wolf in a chair. Another few miles and she would be at the cabin she rented. Once she reverted, she'd leave. She spotted a convenience store just before the last turn off to the cabin. Dottie stocked up. The door opened and the steady entered. The clerk stared at her too long. She paid quickly and left. The mesmerizing lights of a roadside bar beckoned not far up the road. Dottie ducked in to quench her thirst and let the trooper be on his way. She would be at the cabin a while, and this might be her last chance at company until she got her head on straight. Dottie squeezed herself in at the bar between a sexy nurse and a fellow with a clown nose. She held up a hand to the barkeep. He took an undue interest in the birthmark on her wrist. She pulled the sleeve of her shirt over it. After he brought her a drink, Dottie felt every eye in the bar on her. Maybe it was because they thought she was a stranger. The paintings on the walls of wolves in dresses dancing amused her, or resembled her. <laughs> she had a drink, then one drink became four. Her glass never seemed to empty, and that suited her fine. When her vision began to double, Dottie wondered if maybe she should have paced herself. She stumbled to the door. She needed to get to the cabin before it happened again. Where do you think you're going? Dottie froze. A man took her keys and caught her as she swayed. You best sit here and get comfortable. You're not going anywhere for a while. The whole bar had gone quiet. No music played, no conversations, or the thud of darts. Dottie's eyes drooped. Too late, the thought came to her. She had strayed into a nest of hunters. Sleep and awake renewed, someone whispered. From Dottie's chair in the corner, the whole bar had crowded in on her. She's awake! The crowd parted. The steady wheeled a chair containing an ancient tween form wolf mother. Our wolf mother is old, he said. She's been calling across the spirit ways for another to take her place. You're the only one who made it. The wolf mother's wrist bore a similar birthmark to Dottie's. Dottie looked at the paintings again. She took the other wolf's hand. 
Yes, she said. The Scent of Death by Mike Casto My name is Sony, and I smell dead people. That is my job, and my human, Kia, has trained me well. Now, though, I am not on duty. Tonight, Kia and I walk with a bunch of human pups. They are dressed in funny clothes and hide their faces behind masks. They say it is Halloween, so I howl, but Kia shushes me. I am confused, but that is okay. I am with Kia, and we are with human pups, and we are having fun. Until I smell a dead person. Since I am not on duty, I am free to respond without an order. I bolt toward the smell. Kia calls after me, but she does not order. My toenails click as I race across the street onto the sidewalk. <laughs> Death on the air and a job to do. <laughs> The odor leads me through a break in some shrubs, into a yard. By the house, in the light of the full moon, I see two humans. One is short, a pup. The other is tall, an adult. The smell comes from their direction, but they are not dead. I know they are not dead, because they both move. The adult grabs the pup, who yelps with fear. The fear turns to pain, and anger courses through me. Pups are not to be hurt, never. A low growl starts in my breast and moves up my throat as I rush toward the pair. The adult turns its head toward me. Its teeth are not like human teeth. They are more like dog teeth, short and sharp in the middle and bracketed by fangs. As I close the distance, I discover the dead smell comes from the adult. The churning rumble in my chest becomes a full-throated snarl as I bare my own fangs and lunge. The dead-not-dead man raises its arm but I sink my teeth without hesitation. He grunts and dislodges me. I take a chunk of rotten flesh as I fall away. The pup runs screaming into the night. I drop the torn meat and run away from the dead not dead thing, barking furiously. Kia finds her way into the yard. Dead not dead charges her. Kia says, attack. I flatten my ears, bare my teeth and rush to intercept. I zip between his legs and trip him. I clamp onto his throat, my teeth puncturing his skin. He hits me in the chest and I fly away from him. Kia screams with a mixture of anger and fear as I spin through the air and tumble across the grass. In a moment, I'm back on my feet. I drop the meat that had been his throat. Dead not dead is on his feet, but he shouldn't be. He should be dying on the ground, but I realize he's already dead. He runs into the darkness and I start to chase, but Kia orders me to stop. My name is Sony. And I smell dead people. The Chicken and the Well by Clara Miller I hid in my room so I wouldn't have to see the trick-or-treaters. I could have gone, but it wouldn't have been the same without Gabe. Underneath my blankets wasn't much better, though. Not when the room across mine had become his shrine. The folks still hoped he'd return, but it's been a year. Never again would he goad me with chicken, so I'd climb down the oak for whatever Halloween adventure he'd planned, or give me a boost to the first branch when we snuck back inside. And just because he died didn't mean our tradition had to. I hauled open the window, a plan already formed, and crept into the oak. Gabe always wanted to check out the boarded up house down the road. We were supposed to go together, but I chickened out and he left. I don't know where. If I did, maybe the police would have found his body. I didn't want to think about that. With no moon or stars, the night already seemed ominous. I could barely see the fence I swung myself over, which surrounded the house's property. If there had been even a sliver of moonlight, I didn't notice the well gaping beneath me. I didn't even gasp when I plummeted past where the ground was supposed to be, not even when I submerged in freezing groundwater. It wasn't until my feet brushed some unidentifiable thing resting at the bottom that my lungs emptied themselves in a soundless shriek. Probably the remains of the rotted covering, I told myself as I frantically kicked upwards. I wasn't convinced. As soon as I surfaced and regained breath, I yelled for help. Only the wind responded, whistling across the well's rim a dozen feet above. The folks wouldn't figure out I was missing till morning. 
I could tread water fine now, but I wouldn't when the adrenaline wore off and the cold set in. If I didn't get out soon, I never would. I swiftly explored the darkness by touch. The walls were weathered smooth, but there was a single fissure running vertically. My fingers and toes were just small enough to fit in the grooves. It was a harder climb than the oak, especially with my waterlogged clothes. But after a few tries, I managed to pry myself free from the water's chill. But the fissure ended several feet too far from the rim. I wanted to scream. I did when I heard the thing surface. I lost my grip as I tried to twist away, but I didn't fall. Bony hands caught my waist and boosted me above the rim. I scrambled onto the ground, not caring to look down, but a familiar voice chuckled. <laughs> Chicken. Ghost Night by Barbara Lund The wind smelled of autumn with a bite of snow, whipping past her fingers and making them slip on the lock. Take your time, Jay murmured, glancing at her before continuing his scan of the night shadows. No one out here but us. Not on Ghost's Night, Sumi agreed, holding tightly to her magic. It would be so easy to push the tumblers into place, to pull the bolt of the lock back, but if she did that, the Dark Goddess would know and would find her. All hell would break loose. Literally. No, better to do this the hard way. Steadying her hands, she tried again. Click! The inside of the warehouse stank of dust, rats, and decay, but Sumi refused to flinch. She had chosen this life, and there would be no going back. With Jay at her back, she took smooth, slow steps forward, peering into the gloom. Again, the need to use her magic bit at her. She could light tiny dust fires to show her the way, or change her eyes to see more clearly in the dark. She could even pull the items they were seeking to her hand. Stopping to fight the urge down, she felt Jay's fingertips brush the small of her back. That small contact was enough. She'd given up everything. Riches, power, servitors. For him. And how he helped her be a better person. The whole reason they were here was to prove to both of them she didn't need her magic to do this. Onward. Sumi felt dry leaves under her thin-soled boots and lifted her foot before they crunched. She felt the first tickles of a spider web and ducked under it. She remembered Jay's advice to look up and scanned above for threats. And finally, they came to the box they needed. More than any of the others, this one smelled faintly of cold, deep earth. This time, when the urge to use her magic came, she brushed it away more easily. Fishing a tiny knife from her pocket, she used the blade to cut the seals and lifted the top off. She set it aside, then peeked. The box was empty. Jay, she murmured, pointing. He laughed, more a jump of muscles under his shirt than a sound. You didn't really think we'd steal a shipment of gems from my cousin, did you? He pulled her into an embrace. I... maybe? She admitted against his shirt. When she looked up at him, he tapped her nose. No stealing from family, he said with a smile, then sobered, looking past her toward the temple of the dark goddess. At least, not my family. You said we needed the prize, she growled. He flashed the grin she loved. Your prize, on this ghost night, he said, is me. If you can get us out again. Oh, I can. She kissed him, a fleeting press of lips. My prize. You'll Have to Forgive Me, by Dave Strange. I stared at him for a while. Halloween was a pretty popular night for people to come out and mess with the gravesite, but this man seemed somehow different. His calloused fingers pressed down tightly onto the strings of his guitar, and his eyes were closed, as if he existed alone in a vacuum, completely separated from the earth below him. He looked like a mess, hair haphazardly thrown about and face dirty. I approached him and cleared my throat, a bit upset I had to interrupt his playing. Sir, you can't play on top of a gravestone. You'll have to set up somewhere else. 
His eyes looked up at me as he stopped. The cool Halloween wind grew strangely stronger as he spoke. Oh, sorry dude, but I should be fine here, right? I mean, it's my gravestone and all. Edda's Second Chance by Katharina Gerlach Edda didn't want to leave the afterlife to become an invisible friend. Not even the reward, a day of being human again, excited her. She only agreed after securing a second boon. As a slave, sex toy, and tester for a rich Roman, she hadn't enjoyed life. Her only fond memory was of his face, as he realized she'd poisoned the wine. Grinning at the memory, Edda slipped into a little girl's room. Only in second grade, Susie was already a victim to severe bullying. Etta wondered how she might help. It turned out to be easy. Susie was still young enough to believe in her, so Etta scouted routes, kept Susie away from the two bullies, and encouraged her to learn judo, which did wonders for Susie's self-esteem. Halloween rolled around. Since Etta didn't feel like having a day off, she and Susie devised a plan. Hiding behind the trees, Etta followed Susie, and she and her best friend collected sweets. As expected, the bullies showed up soon. Etta jumped out of her hiding place, grabbed the boys' bags, knocked them over hard, and pretended to attack Susie. As discussed, Susie grabbed her lapels and threw her over her shoulder. Etta dropped the bags and fled. Susie handed the boys their bags. After that, they protected her, and Etta was assigned a new case. James's father came home drunk every night and James prayed half the day that he'd be too tired to hit his mom. But that hardly ever happened. Etta did her best to hide the three-year-old, but James's mother's screams found him everywhere. Every night, the boy fell asleep crying, no matter what Etta tried. One day, she hit him in the garage under the car, and James climbed into the motor compartment. Something ripped and squirted oil, so she convinced James to hide someplace else. The next day, his father had a car accident, which kept him in the hospital for months. Unfortunately, that saved his life because doctors discovered a heart problem. During his absence, James bloomed, making friends and even laughing. His mother, too, looked healthier and happier. Until the day her husband returned and the beating commenced. A decision grew in Etta's heart. She could barely wait for Halloween. Rising early, she hugged James and told him to hide in the garden shed at nightfall. He complied. Then, she called in her second boon. When the moon rose, she turned into the grim weeper, scythe and all, and she knocked at the door of James's home. The father opened. Already drunk, he swore and staggered. No party here. He lifted his meaty fist to slam it into her face. With a laugh, she lifted her head so he could look under the hood into the non-existent face. He paled, gurgled, and clutched his chest. With his family hiding, there would be no help. Etta walked away smiling. Maybe being an invisible friend wasn't too bad after all. The Tale of Miss Marie-Claude and the Faux Follet by Arwen Lynchpoe Marie-Claude rested her bottom on the rough boards of her grandmother's porch. Her granddaddy had told her about the fairy lights, the faux filet. He loved to try to scare her on Halloween night. At 15, she was too old for that sort of thing. He shouldn't believe in that. The priest would make him go to confession. She had to confess all the time. She knew she was a bad girl, a sinner. It wasn't her fault. She'd been born bad, according to the Bible, all because of that Eve. Her hair swung forward as she slumped down more. Bad enough, she had to spend her Halloween in the swamp. Something moved. She gasped. Dancing just at the edge of the bayou, a light flickered. As she trained her eyes on it, the yellowish illumination seemed to move from left to right and then back again. Not the way a flashlight would, no. This was more like a flame. She imagined that was what a lantern would look like, still. She couldn't see how someone could be moving it like that, unless they were jumping. But the sparkle didn't go up, just back and forth. Marie-Claude. She jumped off the porch at the sound of her name, 
Turning in a slow circle, she felt the heavy, warm air against her skin. Her heart skipped a few beats, then sped up as she realized there was no one there. A quick glance at the windows proved the adults were still at their card game. Once she faced the bayou again, the light was in a different spot. This time it was closer to her. She heard her name again like a soft whisper. A rabbit gave a high-pitched scream, startling her. Don't be silly, she scolded. It's just an owl getting supper, not some spirit. She backed up anyway, letting the solidness of wood remind her of how close safety was. Some scent drifted to her on the air. Nothing she knew of from the swamp had that smell. This was a musty sweetness making her nose twitch. Marie-Claude leaned forward. She knew that smell, but from where? Sliding her feet forward, she moved toward the light. Her fear slipped away as the light filled her. It was her grandmother from town. She must have known how unhappy her favorite granddaughter was. A laugh bubbled up as she began to run towards the lantern her grand must be carrying. Arms spread wide, she flung herself into the waiting arms. The next morning at church, the weeping hadn't begun. No one knew where Marie-Claude was. Search parties were organized. Dogs were set on the scent. They found a shoe at the edge of the slow-moving dark water. Marie-Claude was never seen again. Her casket was closed and hollow when it came time. Take heed. Stick steel in front of you when you see that dancing light. Let yourself be tricked. Laughter is the last thing you hear as the bayou claims you. Bitten by Mike Barker When I looked back, it was in the shadows. I knew I shouldn't have left the shelter by myself, but I wanted to see my home again. I was so lonely. I thought a glimpse of home would get me through another day. So I snuck out. As I walked through the night, I realized it was following me. Our small town had always seemed so safe. I mean, you didn't even really have to lock your door. Your neighbors would watch out for you. And then the infestation started. Did I see something in the shadows? Yes. It might have been a small bulldog, that low, solid shape. But the way it scurried, that was no dog. Someone blamed the small biotech company out on the Atwoods farm. It could have been. Jim Green said he thought it was the devil. Anyway, they took over our town. A few of us managed to hide in the old bomb shelter at the high school, and we thought surely help would arrive soon. But no one came. I was just a block from my house when I saw a leg reach out into the moonshine. Thick, shiny, black, twisted like some strange root, and bent in odd places. It reminded me of a dwarf's leg I had seen once as if something that should have been long and slender had been squashed. But I thought this was much bigger than it should be. A giant dwarf, maybe. I kept walking, even though I wanted to run. But we had all learned running marked you as prey. A steady walk was better. So I walked, sweat trickling down my neck. I wondered if any of the food I had left at the house was still there. Just thinking about what I had at home made me hungry. I could take some of it back to the shelter, and we could all enjoy it. As I neared home, I heard it. In the silence of the night, it was chittering, and the armored claws on its feet stretched on the sidewalk. Then, just as I saw my porch and the steps, it came into the light. A spider, of course just like all the others that had turned our town into a ghost town. But a giant spider. Its eyes glinted like black diamonds as it ran out and jumped at me. I lifted my arms and it caught my hand in its mouth. It bit sideways. I heard bones breaking and pain, incredible pain, raced up my arm, followed by a tide of numbness as it injected whatever poisons it had. I screamed and fell, looking at the door of my house. The door swung open. The queen spider tilted its head, then struggled to get out the door. It was almost too big to get out of the door, but it wiggled. The door frame creaked, and it came out. It stood over me. 
I was on the menu tonight. Exit Strategies by Lauren M. Catherine Trick or treat! The devil leaned against the door jamb of the abandoned farmhouse. Yes, the devil. In all his glory, black horns spiraling from his head, black scales tinged in burnt orange, and big cloven hooves. Hello, darling, he said. Aren't you just the cutest sparkly bit of brightness in my hellacious day? He stepped in, smoldering darkness, shoving me backward. Chuckling, he sauntered around me, scrutinizing. He stopped at my back, his heat radiating. You know you and Angie are taking my business from me, right? I glanced at my partner in exit strategies, who was paralyzed in the act of packing our gear. He bent close to my ear. You know I don't like that, right? Developers had hired us for tonight, Halloween, the easiest time to clear the property in House of Spirits. The last was a courtly gentleman in the cellar. He seemed nice, I stammered. Well, yes, they always do, which makes them particularly delightful to welcome. But you girls, he tisked, wrapping his arms around me, his pointy chin resting on my head. I just don't know what to do with you two. My breath caught, Angie still frozen, but in her eyes, fierceness? Hey, I know! His forked tongue licked my earlobe. We join forces. He moved to stand in front of me, cloven foot halls shaking the house. Seductively, he smoothed my hair. We'd make a great team. Ugh, but kind of cute, too. The horns, not so much. Still broad shoulders and great biceps. Wait, what was I thinking? My pocket. I yanked out the bottle of our special salt mixture. Sliding closer, his strong arms encircled my waist. His suffocating, burnt odor morphed into the aroma of backyard cookouts of my childhood. I relaxed in his embrace. The bottle fell and broke open. Scents of grandma's lemon cookies, mom's roses, fresh wood shavings and dad's workshop. I snapped out of the devil's enchantment. Scooping a handful of salts, I tossed them, sprinting for the door. The granules sizzled where they struck him. He grabbed me by the collar. Now that isn't a very nice way to start our partnership, is it? Help! Help! Aw, oh, darling, I'll be gentle. I twisted out of his grasp, bolted through the door, tripping over the door sill, and hitting my head on the front porch post. I lay stunned. He stalked toward me. Our mentor had constantly screamed at us. All hell breaking loose? Think divine thoughts. Mind blank. A Christmas song. Angels, we have heard a crack rent the air. Suddenly, Angie transformed, huge and glowing with enormous golden rings. Ah, oh, hell, the devil said. Exactly! Her brilliant sword flashed, consuming the devil in a column of fire. The abandoned house was dark, silent. Angie knelt beside me. You okay? She helped me up. You, you, you! An angel! Right, she snorted. Bumped head. Aspirin. Now. She walked toward the truck. But there, shimmering on the dark porch, a golden feather. This Mask Has No Place By Cameron Petrie Foggy Vancouver on a Halloween day. Frosted leaves mulch on sidewalks as cold darkened branches flicks bare, moistened grips above memories carving jack-o'-lanterns. Halloween crawled out from mines encouraged to suppress. Climate enforcement deemed celebrating it an unfruitful squandering of reprimandable health effects. Excessiveness a wasteful threat. Sugar, wrappers, petrol-based makeup and masks, costumes, single-use witch hats, Halloween was eco-shamed, snuffed and blamed. But Vancouver's summer worked a sleight of hand. 
raining on and off in the scorching heat, creating the perfect weather that conjured the perfect pumpkin patch. For who the perfect pumpkins would illuminate those whose memories lay intact. Those unknowingly strewn pumpkins grew on a neighborhood corner whose residents looked down to Vancouver's eco core while walking their grounds talking about better days past. The dark, bare branches held claw-like to the back of the blanketing fog. The mulched, rotting muck of leaves sat frozen, staving off decomposition. And the pumpkin patch vines sat slimed as a scarecrow followed the rotting yellow tendrils to where the orange fruits once attached. Costumes were planned in basements, in neighborly winks, Yarns, fabrics, and old rubber masks slipped into reusable grocery bags in public streets. Children who learned from their parents about the silence that saves quietly removed cases from pillows. Harmless fun kept from the eyes of the larger sum that governed this city, this place, this eco-world where waste should not grow. Harmless fun because the pumpkins wrung something deep in the memories of those that lived when strangers became navigable to children with brave greets demanding sugared treats. Harmless fun. She breathed. She exhaled through her forgotten contraband, a green witch mask. She's nervous, older, but knows her crowd well. The fog didn't lift. This part of town isn't known. So kids passed from house to house, emptying at hers, where the scarecrow waited all season for pumpkins to show. Those pumpkins, why? She didn't think so. Kids dumping pillowcases squatted in the living room as masked, decorated adults talked of a while ago. Holding antique carbonated drinks as goodies of dried kale, homemade incense, and those dangerous, along past do things called chocolate bars, still sparkled like before. The pumpkins glowed on the front porch because he said, we've relaxed about these things. Halloween's not a threat. It's a one-time thing. It's nighttime. They can't expect a return. The fog's well heavy for small fish. Still, the front porch glowered as shiny, dark, oiled boots reflected those carved, gawking smiles. The door sounded, pounding a crowd-shaking fist. The kids cried as parents kicked away candy piles in horror. Her farm girl daughter, picnic basket holding a supposed-to-be-that-dog stuffed otter, tried answering for the door. After the cladded, blackened boots stormed, the fog began lifting, slithering up through the dark branch like fingers of the barricaded neighborhood taped off as core irreprimandable. The scarecrow stowed away, waiting, watched for another Halloween to grow. Herbert's Paranoia by Doug Glassford Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Is it that time of the year again? Herbert sighed, wringing his hands as he paced back and forth across his kitchen floor, his eyes glued to the calendar taped upon the pantry door. I'm going to be strong. This year, I'm going to do it. I miss Halloween. Raised social, now a recluse, he hated it. He remembered how he and his three siblings spent days decorating the house and yard paying particular attention to the old red barn where they'd host their best parties. Family and friends came from miles around to join in the week-long celebration. But that was years ago. Today, he was the only one left of his brood on the fallow farmstead. He shuddered when he remembered the fire that had ruined everything, and how his schoolmates had mocked and bullied him and beat him for being different. He couldn't help that his fingers had melted together leaving him with flippers, or that his face and body looked like a melted candle. His one good eye required a custom-made monocle strapped to his knobby head, covered in sprouts of bristly hair reminiscent of a damaged coral reef. He quit school and stayed out in the fields working during the daylight hours, or slept and stayed up all night observing the sky and surrounding houses. 
and the people who dwelt in them. How he wished to be normal again. How he wished for acceptance. Herbert determined to overcome his fear of the young costumed revelers and hoped to make new friends. The constant loneliness was eating his brain. He set a large bowl of candies on a stool next to the front door. For the first time in what felt like forever, his walkway was lit, and a carved glowing pumpkin sat on the porch. Herbert could hear the sounds of trick-or-treaters coming up his drive. Fright and delight wrestled within him as he hurried into the bathroom. Standing in front of the mirror, twitching, he said, I can do this. He tried to ignore the tick batting his good eye or the nervous sweat that tickled the vacant socket of his missing eye. Herbert sucked in his breath and strode to the door. The door handle rattled audibly as Herbert turned the latch. He took a deep breath and flung the door wide open. For an eternal moment, he and the children on his porch stood frozen, staring at each other. Hey dude, you look awesome, said the big kid dressed like a deranged pickle. You gotta come with us. With a costume like that, we'll score a lot more goodies. You'll scare the crap out of mean old lady Collins. The rest of the group nodded and chanted, Yes, come with us. Herbert emptied the bowl of candy into their eager bags. Teary-eyed, Herbert bounded off his porch and skipped up the street amidst his new friends, laughing, ready to seek out the best the festive night could bring. Family Time by Bonnie Burns Rachel shrugged her hoodie tighter, dodging the raindrops. The scene played over in her head, dinner burning on the stove, her father sitting at the table, his head in his hands, her baby brother wailing on the floor for some Halloween candy just out of reach, and her mother screaming at her to get out, get out, and never come back. When she'd left, it was a warm fall night, but the weather had turned, but now she was drenched and freezing. She needed Kate to hold her until the feeling came back, to tell her they could be happy together, to help her shut out the terrible words. Rachel looked at the string of unanswered texts on her phone and shivered. She ducked into an alley to get out of the worst of the wind and froze. A table set for two glowed in a puddle of light. Her mother and father, sitting at opposite ends, smiled at each other. Her baby brother, perched in his high chair, blew a bubble. A breeze twisted through the alley, and the light trembled, and then nothing. Rachel's mouth went dry. She backed out of the alley and ran to the subway entrance a block away, hopping on the first train that stopped. She got out her phone, pushing away the nightmare of her happy family. Are you there yet? I'm freezing. She closed her eyes, relaxing into the rumble and hum of the ride. When she opened them, they were sitting right in front of her, all together on the couch, a blue glow lighting their faces. Every few seconds, her parents laughed. Her brother chewed a rubber llama. Mom, Rachel whispered. Her mother looked at Rachel with a slight frown on her face, then turned back to the invisible TV. Mom! Rachel's voice was sharp, scared. Annoyed, her mother reached and grabbed a remote out of thin air. This show has gone off the rails, she said, and pointed the remote at Rachel. And then nothing. Trying to hold down her panic, Rachel got off at the next stop. In ten minutes, she'd be at Kate's. She started walking, keeping her eyes on her feet, but the sound of squealing brakes forced her to look up. In the middle of the dark, rain-slick street, she saw her family one last time. Orange paper ribbons floated in the air. Her mother carried the baby on her hip. Her father carried an axe. The jack-o'-lantern glowed between them, ghoulish and grim. And there was Kate, eyes bright, her lips rounded as if ready for a kiss. Blow it out, dear, her mother said to Kate, but she was looking directly at Rachel. Kate, don't, Rachel cried and stepped into the light. She heard a loud electric crack and then nothing. Nothing but Kate 
standing right there with a silly grin, holding a pumpkin. She laughed. Rachel, why are we standing in the freezing rain? Let's go home. And that was everything. Doppelganger by Sarah A. Hoyt No, he's not me. He spies on me from my mirror. I wake in the night and look at the mirror behind my door and see him watching me. Don't tell me I'm imagining it. I'm not. Yes, he looks exactly like me, with the same color eyes and hair. But he is not me. He watches me with a hunger bordering on despair. As if I'm doing something he wishes he could do. And that's the scariest of all because, you know, I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to college. I go to class. I come back to the dorm. I don't even have a girlfriend. And that's the other thing, because sometimes there's this woman with him in the mirror. She's dark and beautiful, like a model. She stands beside him and watches me also. I remember the woman. It's a face I know. I think she was that woman who tried to convince me to go drinking with her after the freshman orientation three years ago. I was, I was tempted, don't get me wrong. I mean, be beautiful women don't come on to me every day. But there was something wrong about her eyes, like the look in my double's eyes as he looks at me out of the mirror. I refused. I haven't seen her since, not even in class. So I don't know why, if this is all an illusion, she should be there beside him in the mirror. Alexandra comes over sometimes to look in my mirror. Her own stopped displaying anything centuries ago. It shows a murky bottomlessness, a nothing like the surface of a lake. You think under there somewhere, there must be something, but there never is. All I know is that when I look in my mirror, I see myself. Mostly sleeping, of course, since I'm only aware at night, when that other me sleeps. But even asleep, there is a remnant of the daylight world around him. The book bag he takes to class, a t-shirt tossed on the chair, a pair of shorts flung on the floor, flip-flops, sunscreen. It seems so long ago, it was only three years. I meant to study law. The other day, when I looked out of the mirror, he was at the computer, and there was an email from my mom. I would have cried if I still knew how. And then Alexandra said, he's just reading email, come on, let's go hunt. She flung out of the room and I followed. Alexandra is fun to hunt with. She attracts people, she intoxicates them. She made it easy to lure them to a secret alley and drink their blood. It is true a vampire doesn't see his reflection in a mirror. He sees the reflection of who he would be if he hadn't allowed himself to be seduced by the shadows and the dark. If he were still alive. The story of what will never be. Baby Blues by Nina Hobson when is child services getting here? They were supposed to be here already, she complained. Her husband shrugged. You know how they are, hardly ever on time. Just then a petite, friendly woman burst through the door. I'm here. Sorry I'm late, Mr. and Mrs. Richardson. You know how I can be with traffic at this time of day. The husband glared at her. No, we don't. The worker frowned. Our files show that this is the eighth baby boy you've given up for adoption, we... He moved closer to his wife. Is there any more paperwork we have to fill out, Mrs. Lattimore? She glanced between the agitated parents. No, sir. The exhausted woman ignored the newborn as he cast sleepy eyes on her. She picked him up and thrust him at the worker none too gently. Then take him and go. In their new home, the woman lounged on cool sheets. 
She ran a pale hand along her slightly rounded belly. We should celebrate, honey. We're free of that thing. Her husband chuckled. And we will, but you still need to rest. I hope it never happens again. I don't think I can go through the pain again. It gets worse every single time. This last time... Her husband stroked her cheek. We're starting over with a new name, in a new house, halfway across the world. He won't find us. We're safe, I'm sure of it. He kissed her firmly, eased himself off the bed. I'm going to the post office. Do you want anything while I'm out? His wife bolted straight up and reached out for him. You're leaving? He quickly sat back down next to her, took her trembling hands in his own. Be careful, baby. Look, it's been months. I don't think we have anything to be worried about, sweetheart. How about I pick up some ice cream? Yes, I think strawberry swirl this time. A crazy grin nearly split her face in two. I'll bet you it's our girl. He laughed, just as enthused as he untangled their fingers and crossed the short distance to the bedroom's entrance. Well, the doctor said she wouldn't be able to tell until your next ultrasound, but if you say so, sweetie. He stopped at the door as a thought crossed his mind. Do you want to come with me? We can get acquainted with our new hometown. She shook her head. Nope. I'm going to take your advice and nap a while. He moved off, called over his shoulder. I'll be back soon. The screams echoed before his car hit the end of their street. Muffled sobs drew him straight to his wife upon returning. Blood smeared her spread legs as the last of an umbilical cord slithered up inside her, the unwanted infant making her stomach undulate uncontrollably. She held out a mashed lump of crimson flesh. He gasped out a strangled, No! I told you it was a girl. Henry Moves House by Nick Stephen Henry had liked lively places when he was alive, and he had not changed after death. He loved it when the kids came to his house. Okay, he did scare them away. He was dead, after all, and there wasn't much fun to be had for a ghost haunting an ordinary Victorian row in an empty street. And the kids were laughing as well as screaming when they ran away. He loved to watch them as they crept towards the house, giggling and daring each other to climb in. There were fewer kids lately, though, as people moved out of the crumbling houses around the district. He wished he could find somewhere livelier to haunt. He was a daytime ghost. Couldn't understand the ghosts who haunted at night. There were not enough people around. He woke from his version of sleep one morning, already bemoaning the fact that his house was far too quiet. He decided to go out into the district and have a little fun out there. That was odd. There was absolutely no one around. He looked in some of the houses. They were empty of everything. Possessions, furniture, absolutely everything. Just like his own haunt, though in better repair. He returned home to think about this. As he faded through the wall of his house, he heard a loud crashing noise. He hurried back outside. A huge wrecking ball was swinging at the end of the house in the row. He moved closer to investigate. A man with a clipboard appeared to be supervising things. Henry poured enough will into himself to materialize and speak to the man. Knocking this house down, he asked. The man turned and sniggered at Henry's Victorian attire. Not just this house, mate. The whole street. In fact, the whole estate has got to go. You'll have to find somewhere else for your Victorian reenactments. Henry moved out of sight before fading into invisibility. Where could he go? The rest of the town was mostly modern, and a Victorian ghost just would not be believed. He wandered disconsolately. As evening fell, he found himself on what appeared to be a construction site. He could not make out what was happening in the twilight, but he did see one building that was complete. It was not suitable for him, as it was a small castle, a folly but it would do to rest for the night. Inside it was pitch dark and he passed lots of cobwebs as he searched for a place to rest. In the morning, he was woken by children, screaming and laughing. All around him were strange figures dropping and popping up on mechanisms. The children were riding a small train. 
On the front, he could just make out the words, Barlin's Ghostly Express. He laughed with joy and materialized near the front of the train. To his delight, the children laughed and screamed, pointing at him. He was home. Hell's Grannies by V.S. Stark Officer Jenkins spotted an older gray sedan matching the description of the one used by the water tagger. He put on the lights and siren, hoping the guy would run. To his disappointment, the car immediately pulled over. When he reached the driver's window, he nearly groaned aloud. There were four elderly ladies in it, ranging from merely old to ancient. He could hardly admit he'd mistaken them for a carload of kids with super soakers who were targeting smokers. Do you ladies have identification? Aren't you sweet, quavered the ancient one in the back seat. I've been old enough to drink for quite some time, dear. The driver looked embarrassed. I'm so sorry, officer. She thinks she's on a cruise in Mexico. He's not the cabana boy, Marjorie, bellowed the other one in the back seat. Well, I know that, Helen, snapped Marjorie. Cabana boys wear far less clothing. He's our waiter. Pity he'd look good wearing far less. The policeman clamped his jaw shut and looked at the driver. She was now hiding her face in her hands. The tips of her ears were red. With a helpless look, Helen bellowed, He's the captain of the ship, Marjorie. Try to behave. Keep to the speed limit, ma'am. Officer Jenkins strode back to his car. The car pulled sedately back into the lane. Helen was bellowing that the ship was out of margaritas until the next port. When they were out of sight, Jenkins let out the laugh that was nearly busting his gut. It was a good ten minutes before he felt safe to drive. A few miles down the road, Marjorie rubbed her ear. Honestly, Helen, if you keep bellowing in my ear like that, I really will be deaf. Sorry, Helen said in a normal voice. It works every time, though. They decide we're a bunch of fluttery old deers and can't be bothered with us. More like senile old bats, Marjorie sighed. April intervened hastily from the driver's seat. How do you keep coming up with new material? I never know what you two are going to say next. Marjorie laughed. That's why you're so convincing. It's fun embarrassing you like that. Jane, who always called shotgun, was brooding in the front seat. Do you think we need to cool it for a while? Helen fidgeted, lining up the cane to take an imaginary shot at the car next to them. We can't. There are so many of them flipping their ashes out the car windows as if the grass weren't tinned or dry at this time of year. There's no rain in the forecast until after Halloween. Still, I think we're done for the day. We don't want that poor young man to actually see us committing a crime. Marjorie smirked and patted the oxygen tank next to her. Not that he'd believe it with the job Jane did on this thing. April signaled and turned carefully toward home. The water tagger was retiring for the evening. American Gothic by Phil Kenrick Emmett Gaff had always been a pious and peaceful man. He worked his farm, fed his family, and worshipped his God. He was a good and decent man, but every man has his breaking point. The crash was only last October, in 1929. Banks traded mortgages like baseball cards, and one of the collectors was Sherwood Stewart. Emmett, who never used foul language, referred to him as the lowest piece of shit in the cesspool. Even though times were hard, sacrifices were made and Emmett kept his payments current. The Gaff Farm was a very desirable piece of property. 294 acres of rich farmland located close to town. The farm was valuable, but Emmett didn't care about that. Only his family mattered, his wife Sarah, sons Josh and Will, and his daughter Emily. Emmett looked up and saw Stuart's car leading a cloud of dust down the driveway. He stood up from working on the grinder for the manure spreader and wiped his hands. Morning, Mr. Gaff. Stuart said, sticking out a pudgy paw, but Emmett only looked at the outstretched hand. Stuart retrieved his hand and handed over an official-looking paper. Foreclosure notice, he handed it back. You can't foreclose on me. My payments is up to date. Well, Mr. Gaff, I have a contract right here. That's not the contract I signed. No, it's not, 
But you see, your loan was purchased by my bank, and there are some different rules. You can always refinance. No one is making loans right now. What you trying to pull? Now, Mr. Gaff, please don't make me come back with the law. We are done talking, Stuart. Emmett turned and started walking into the barn, but Stuart spied Emily as she gathered eggs. He licked his pudgy, pink lips, gawking at the pretty young girl. You know, Mr. Gaff, that daughter of yours gets prettier every time I see her, Stuart said. Maybe we could work something out. What does that mean, work something out? The girl there. She's not so much a girl anymore. And, well, I could use a little uh, help around the house. Maybe we could work out a deal. Emmett knew what he meant. He had heard stories about the young girls he had violated with no payment for his sin. So, what do you think? The fat man hissed. A wave of anger rushed over Emmett. Grabbing the three-tined pitchfork, he thrust it through Stuart, nearly pulling the man's feet off the ground. He yanked the tool from his torso. Stuart stood for a moment as the blood pumped from his body, then finally fell back into the feed box for the spreader. The fat man lay there twitching. Cow manure mixed with blood dotted his pudgy face. Sarah looked out the window and watched her husband run the manure spreader up and down the perfectly straight rows in preparation for the upcoming spring planting. Escape Room by E.A. Brandon Halloween, it's a scream, say my name and end your dream. I open the door and find another room. It's always another room. This must be the world's longest escape game. The ghosts in the Shanghai tunnels of Portland? Unnerving, but cool. The House of the Villisca Axe Murders? Okay, that one rattled me, but only because that was where I started to feel like a rat in a maze. Then my friend Julia lost her mind in a tower of terror. You know the veil between worlds is thin during Halloween, she sobbed. Demons own this place will never escape. It's so sad when somebody believes in such mumbo-jumbo. As a scientist, I know there's no such thing. This isn't hell. Hell doesn't exist. Though what this is, I remain unsure. At the Waverly Hills Sanatorium, Julia followed a ghost down the death tunnel, and I haven't seen her since. She must have escaped, but I heard the song. Halloween, it's a scream, say my name and end your dream. I walk down a cobweb-filled hallway, lined with murder holes that emit skittering noises. Along the way, there are 13 pumpkins, each on a pedestal. At the end is a long table with a single pumpkin, a knife, and a candle. The jack-o'-lantern hologram appears in the center of the wall. Not exactly a dungeon of doom. Still... A seed of fear implants itself in my brain. Something is very different in this room. I walk to the table and see a faint outline on the pumpkin. I inspect it with the candle. It's the letter M. All of the other pumpkins in the hall have a letter on them as well. I collect them and carve out the letters. I end up with 14 brightly glowing jack-o'-lanterns. E. P. M. H. T. H. S E I E S P L O. An anagram? I look around the room for clues, but outside of a blood like liquid starting to leak from the walls, there is nothing. I cannot hear that song again. If I do, I will go mad. The song. The song is my clue. Say my name, I repeat. It's obvious. The anagram is someone's name. Whose name? The one minute warning sounds and I frantically throw pumpkins about. Eloise? Eloise who? Halloween. It's a scream. Say my name and end your dream. I have lost. The liquid dripping from the walls gushes into a torrent and by the smell of it, I know that it's real blood. Excellent work, Bifrons. 
Mephistopheles entered the room smiling. I do love scientists, my lord. They're so unwilling to accept what they can't empirically prove. Mephistopheles nodded. Julia said my name. Had she listened to her friend, she could have survived. Speaking of Julia, where is she? I gave her to Nidhogg. He said he is having her for dinner. Bifrons nodded and returned to his work. They're so much tastier when terrified. Family Tree by E. M. Labar Bees. That's how the buzzing sounded. Like a swarm of bees trapped inside Janie's head, making her dizzy. The spots that modeled her vision didn't look like bees, though. They were purple. Who ever heard of a purple bee? That was her last thought as her knees buckled, and she slumped into the nearby tree, falling unconscious. Janie, sweetheart, open your eyes. You are okay, honey, I promise. The voice was familiar and comforting, but she couldn't identify it. She needed to see the face. It was silly, really. She'd only left the homestead a few times in her life and had only known a handful of people. The voice sounded a little like Aunt Simone, but there was something else, something softer, stronger. Janie missed Aunt Simone so much. Memories of fun times flashed across her mind before another memory interrupted. It was right after Mama had died. Aunt Simone was telling her to be brave. Sweet child, always remember that you're never alone. You should stand tall and proud because your family is always there for you, even when you can't see us. Your Mama Mal and Auntie Ina, our Mama and Aunties, their Mama and Aunties, they are all walking with us every step. We honor them by honoring our own truths. We must walk our paths, no matter how scary or uncertain things may get. It's okay to be scared, but never let fear get in the way. Janie's resolve sprang into place. Her eyes adjusted to the blinding light. The face that hovered above her was one she knew only from photos around the house. She squeaked in surprise. Mama? But how? Yes, sweetheart, I'm here. Just like Simone told you I'd be. Hush now. But Mama, they said you died. Are you really here? Am I dead? Was it the purple bees? What's going on? Mal smiled, caressing Janie's cheek. Shh, you're fine. Just sleeping. Now calm down. We don't have long to talk, and there's a lot to be said. Janie nodded, thankful the headache was retreating. Today is Halloween. The veil between the worlds is thin enough for us to talk when you sleep. I want you to know that I'm always with you, even when you can't see me. You carry me and Simone in your heart, always. But Simone and Ina and all our female ancestors are also here, connected to this place, by this tree. Anytime you need us, you come to this tree. It is a sacred place to our family. Draw strength from that. Mal began fading as she spoke, her voice becoming but a whisper at the end. As her image faded, she touched one of the bright red leaves on the ancient oak. As Janie regained consciousness, she shook her head at the crazy dream. A single, impossibly green leaf glinted at her in the sunlight against a sea of fiery red. She reached out, whispering, Mama? And the leaf trembled at her touch. Pumpkin Eaters by Lee Lowry well, that's a mighty fine apple pie, Mima. Sheriff West rose to take his leave. Are you sure you don't want a squad in the vicinity tonight, Popo? Evans, no, Sheriff. You boys got more important things to do on Halloween than watch our pumpkin patch. You come around after Sunday dinner and enjoy a piece of my famous pumpkin pie. The secret is harvesting the pumpkins at the right time, Mima said. That night, Mima treated a steady stream of spooks, goblins, and princesses. At eight o'clock, as she reached to turn off the porch light, three masked men appeared from nowhere. They wore three stooges masks. 
Aren't you boys a bit old to be out begging treats? Mima asked. We don't want your treats, old hag. We want your money, Curly said. And you're going to treat us to it, or you're going to get some tricks. This was Mo. Popo sidled up next to Mima and racked the shotgun he held. Jeremy Johnson, I know that's you behind that mole mask. You should be ashamed of yourself. You boys get on out of here. Popo kept the shotgun leveled with their guts. Maybe we'll help ourselves to some pumpkins then, Larry said as the trio backed away. Oh, please, leave the pumpkins be. You'll be sorry if you disturb them. Mima wrung her hands in her apron. The masked men scurried off the porch. You're the ones who'll be sorry, one shouted, as they disappeared into the darkness. Popo shook his head and locked up. In their fifty-odd years on the farm, they'd never known a peaceful Halloween. What about the pumpkins, Popo? Should we call Sheriff Wes? No need. You warn them. The pumpkins will take care of themselves. They always do. Mima sighed. Then she pulled out a skein of black yarn and her circular knitting needles. We're going to need another hood, I think. I've only got two from last year. They sat quietly. Mima's knitting needles clicked rhythmically. Popo sat in his rocker and smoked his pipe, cradling the shotgun across his lap. The sounds of hooting, hollering, and the inevitable screaming reverberated from the field. When the mantel clock chimed midnight, the ruckus subsided. Mima bound off a knitting, then slip stitched one end together. Bedtime, Popo. Come morning, they headed to the patch with a cart and a hatchet and surveyed the wreckage. Smashed pumpkins littered the field. Will you look at that? Three pumpkins left for pies. Good thing I knitted this extra hood. Mima and Popo admired the untouched plump pumpkins, each embedded with a Three Stooges mask. Thick green tendrils twined around the globes, holding them firmly in place. Popo nudged one pumpkin with his boot. The eyes behind the mo mask grew wide. We'll save the Jeremy pie for ourselves, Popo said as he harvested the bounty. Mima nodded in agreement. She patted each pumpkin tenderly before covering it with a knitted hood. She hated watching them cry. I Don't Do Halloween Parties by Jelaine Locke I don't do Halloween parties. Not ever. Damn it, Tiff. Stop staring at Reggie and listen to me. You have to go to Daddy's party. You owe me. Tiffany patted Janet's cheek. I will be here tomorrow at 8 p.m. with a limo. And your buttergly dog gives me the creeps. Please don't, Janet whispered, but it was too late. Tiff was gone. Janet felt the debt settle over her and faced Reggie's accusing glare. It's a terrible idea, but debts have to be paid. Maybe this time it won't be a disaster. He snorted and turned back to the television. A text and an insistent doorbell woke her the next day. I am sending you a costume. You are a witch princess. Own it! She opened the front door, took the loaded hanger, and headed into the kitchen to make coffee. Lots of coffee. Janet scowled at her black poofy dress and excess cleavage. The witch hat, tiara, and mask combo were hideous. Thankfully, the sparkly handbag concealed her weapons, and her own long black gloves covered her arms. Ready. Tiff swept in, a ruthless blonde pixie in a cat mask, a diamond tiara, and a poofy cold skirt. She twirled. Like it? I'm a Lion King princess. She smirked and handed Janet a short pair of silk gloves. I remembered you don't like touching people. Change gloves and move it. She heard a Janet out the door. The party was rich snobs, fake laughter, and unsettled jabs. Tiffany abandoned her. Janet sighed and found a corner, prepared to endure. Four hours to midnight, constant vigilance, no skin contact. By 10 p.m., drunk partygoers began bumping into her, and at 11 p.m., the first fight broke out. A security guard touched her elbow. Oh, no. His body twisted violently, and a seven-foot ogre stood in his place. Crap. 
She grabbed a sleep amulet from her purse, tossed it on him, body slammed him into the wall. All eyes were still on the fight. Whew. From 11 to 12, she created, then slept, a goblin, a troll, and a ghoul. Almost over. As midnight struck, an overly excited Tiffany swept in and grabbed her upper arms. Come dance! No! Too late. The Tiff lioness leaped on Janet and bit her arm as she fumbled for a sleep amulet. Blood dripping and despairing, she slapped on the amulet and shrank Tiff until she could carry her. Time to go. Tiffany woke at sunrise and Janet talked. My touch makes monsters on Halloween. The golden cat hissed at her. And my blood makes the spell permanent. Reggie sniffed at the cat, staying out of claw reach. Tiffany, meet Reginald Hobarth. He's the last monster that bit me. Until we find a cure, welcome to the family. Popcorn in a movie? Jack Slick Budger's Monsterly Bar and Grill by Ken Casey. Jack served the best club sandwiches in western Maine. His wife's artisanal stone wines paired well with his thinly sliced game meat. The lonely couple had quit their off-grid birch tree paradise, opening a rustic inn which catered to traveling monsters. The twilight tourists who haunted the countryside just before the first snows blew through the great northeast. His epic zombie plate consisted of shaved pig brain glazed in maple syrup, set upon a bed of microgreens on soft toast, quite appealing to the loose jaws of his decrepitating clientele. Vamps preferred corned beef, while werewolves were delighted in seared deer on thick slices of stale dark pumpernickel. Eva served her mulled cyanotic beverage only on Halloween, which appetized their savage tongues with a deathy taste, pumping a haunted courage into their soulless forms. What gives, innkeeper? A bristle-haired tower of fur said, challenging his host. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, my good beast, Jack replied, his wary smile lit by the large stone hearth's glow. This sandwich has no meat in it, the furry challenger growled, his glower now replaced with widening eyes that sparked like a blacksmith's forged iron billet. Nonplussed, Jack took the liberty to lift the lid off his customer's fare, noting the sad and puny rabbit fillet sulking in an unsavory olive oil drizzle. Grabbing a dusty bottle of cherry pit wine, Eva rushed from the barside, refilling her testy patron's mug. She curtsied, grimacing curtly. Mollified, the skeptical werewolf lifted his vessel with a clean paw. The room grew quiet. To our hosts, may they live long enough to deliver some hot sizzling venison, or die trying. Two werewolves seated in the corner, and a large table of random spooks cheered. Glasses clinked as spirited conversation resumed. Forcing grins, Jack and Eva departed quickly for the pantry. How are we going to handle this, Jack? Eva whined, her hands shaking at the prospect of becoming a casualty at supper's end. We could get him drunk, Jack suggested quickly. It's him or us. Let's poison him, he suggested, fishing for agreement. You had me at poison. Let's serve him up to the rest. We've got a full house, and goodness knows we don't want those other beasts making the same toast. What do you say, Jack? Wringing his hands, he nodded. You freshen his wine with a pittier batch. I'll get my cleaver. Returning to the main hall, props in hand, Jack and Eva were greeted by an eager audience who had heard their whole conversation. Jack looked at Eva and said, darned canine hearing, Jack swung his cleaver, slicing off the offended werewolf's ear. Eva doused him with the uncorked wine, some splattering on the cooking fire. A raging plume ignited the creature, his matted hair singeing and burning like a low-quality plush toy. Pandemonium ensued. The remaining creatures, both great and small, moved in on the terrified couple. As tables, curtains, and then wooden walls caught flame, the monsters feasted on an early Halloween dessert. Caramelized humans. 27 by S. R. Olson. Here's your damn baby wipes, 27. Jane stepped aside as her twin sister Sue barged into the house. Sue glared at Jane's ratty robe. 
Have you even taken a shower since we moved you in here? It burns, Jane mumbled, sitting at the table. It does not burn, Sue snapped. The plumber checked the settings on the water heater and turned it way down. With gloved hands, Jane reached for the packet of baby wipes. Tugging it open, she stuffed her nose inside and inhaled the powder-fresh aroma. Even she was bothered by her own body odor lately. I brought you more soup, too. Sue started unloading groceries. With a disgusted grunt, she tugged a loaf of moldy bread out of the cabinet. Come on, 27. Can't you do anything for yourself? Jane shrugged and reached for her book. Where'd that come from? Sue snatched the book away. Secrets of serial killers? Really, Jane? I found it in the closet. Jane took the book back. Are you still doing those online therapy sessions I arranged for you? Sue sat across from Jane, her tone softening. Not lately, Jane said, avoiding eye contact. Sue scowled. What? I scheduled a home visit so she could prove to you that there's nothing wrong with your shower. Did she at least do that? Jane nodded. And? I haven't seen her since, Jane said. Unbelievable. Sue shook her head. She rose to her feet, her nose crinkled. You stink, 27. Jane frowned. I wish you'd stop calling me that. Sue scowled. If it was good enough for Mom, it's good enough for me, especially now. She stepped behind Jane's chair and tugged it away from the table. Mom always said that extra 27 minutes you spent in the womb really messed you up, and I agree. That's probably why she took off without a word. She couldn't take any more of your crap. It wasn't my fault, Jane mumbled. Come on, you're taking a shower. No, it burns. Jane gripped the sides of her chair. Sue rolled her eyes, then grabbed Jane's arms and wrestled her from the chair. Shower, Jane, now. Jane stumbled down the hall, Sue shoving her every step of the way. Stop bossing me around, Jane bit out the words. Sue turned the shower on, then tugged Jane's robe off. Get in. Jane shook her head. They tussled back and forth. Jane pushed. Sue fell. The sharp crack of breaking bone echoed. Jane backed away as her sister's face transformed from surprise to pain to horror. As she flailed on the slippery shower floor, her arms outstretched and eyes growing wider as her eyelids dissolved. Rivers of red slid down the drain. Jane squeezed her eyes shut and waited for the gurgling screams to stop. She shut the shower off, then lifted the scissors out of a drawer and jammed it down the drain. It was always the teeth that got caught in the strainer. The Nightshade of Blackwood Hollow by Eliza K. Gillum Cameras show what's there not what we see. The Polaroid Mrs. Latimer left at the photo booth showed a shadow ghost, or a nightshade as Dad would have called it, in Mrs. Latimer's form and costume. Unable to find her at the Blackwood Hollow Halloween Festival, I biked to her house. Like Dad, I could see the shadow world of the dead and banish them when they hurt the living. The house stood dark and silent. Even the antique style decorations seemed spooky in the shadows. The muggy South Carolina air couldn't stop the shiver down my spine. I'd seen a nightshade before, and they didn't leave much behind. An incorporeal creature, it needed the existence of a human for a corporeal form. Nothing for it, since Dad wasn't here. I'd have to take care of it myself. I gripped the heavy flashlight tighter and followed the inky trail of ooze up the steps and past the gargoyles. I grabbed a decorative broom from the witch on the porch before stepping inside, just in case. Hello? I called out on the off chance she was still alive. Mrs. Latimer? It's Maggie. In the kitchen, dear, said a deep, crackly voice. I crept into the kitchen and swept the bright beam around the large room. It caught the skeletal frame of Mrs. Latimer slumped at the kitchen table. The nightshade perched on the countertop, a candied apple in each hand. Its top half still held the form of Mrs. Latimer, 
while the bottom half resembled a dark shroud with ragged ends that moved as if legs swung back and forth. Do you know I can't get these delectable treats any other time of year? Really? Nothing like a ghost with a sweet tooth. What happened to her? I pointed the light at the skeleton. Oh, her. It bit an apple in half. She refused to make me candied apples. Said they were too sweet. So I took her essence. Oh. Poor Mrs. Latimer, who hated sweet things. The nightshade grinned at me, bearing sharp, pointy teeth. Can you make candied apples? It waved a hand at dozens of apples sitting on the counter, all rolled in caramel and dipped in a variety of toppings. No. I lied and gripped the broom tighter. Too bad. I'd rather hoped we could make a deal. The nightshade shed the rest of its humanoid form and shifted into an amorphous shadow, darker than black, that absorbed all the light. Perhaps you'll make a tasty treat. It lunged at me. Not tonight! I dropped the flashlight and swung the broom at it. The broom whooshed through it. The nightshade retreated in a black fog. Before it regrouped, I drew a pattern in the air that glowed pale blue as it touched the ghost. The nightshade screeched and froze mid-movement. No more candied apples for you! I snapped my fingers. It faded to an ashy gray and shattered into a million pieces. Unlike by P.K. Prairie. Hidden in the shadows he focuses, pushing skin here, muscle there, concentrating on remolding the body. He is certain he feels his flesh shift, limbs contract, ear tips fall, horns begin to recede. But then it all collapses back. He rails against the ritual that changed him on his 13th birthday. He hates this feeling of being powerless over his destiny. Why, why was I born to this? His cry of frustrated anger erupts into the chill air. Almost like a mocking echo, a moan calls back to him from the depths of the alley. Startled, he stiffens. The cry comes again and he moves toward the sounds before he has consciously registered that the agonized syllables are in the ancient language. The Dryu is lying in a pool of sapphire blood, its frail bird-shaped form broken. Ignoring the taboos that hold those of demon blood away from such beings, he kneels and draws it onto his lap. The sacred creature, both Wren and Druid, is mortally wounded and the prophecy it murmurs barely audible. This Sawin, blood lies unmasked, like is not like, dark needs the light. A disgruntled anger fills him, one more mystery, he thinks, and now he must waste time taking the Dryu to the ewes, to the trees that hold the powers of death and rebirth. For this night is Samhain, the night when evil is roused and when, concealed amongst humans celebrating Halloween, his fellow demons roam freely through the streets. The night of his thirteenth year. The night of his thirteenth year, the night he is destined to join them in their revels, now for the first time in his adult form, transformed by his tainted blood. He stands, cradling the small body inside his shirt, visualizing the alchemy on its feathers absorbing into his skin. Running through the streets, he is sure he is faster than ever before. This road ends at the edge of the city, and ahead he glimpses the ewes on the grounds of the largest estate. The trees that he knows are there, on the manicured lawns of his ancestral home. Suddenly, a wild-looking gang of ragged grotesques appears directly in his path. Demon or human, it's impossible to tell. They close in, and now he can distinguish those nearest to him are smaller and somehow disjointed. Not what they seem. Humans costumed for this night. But what comes behind is not so benign. A familiar scent. The taint of blackness demon get his closest relations without thinking he surges forward leaps over the children extends his arms protectively and herds them swiftly towards the yew trees then knowing them safely within the trees guardian magics he turns and faces the evil 
like yet not like, he realizes. Then he feels a fluttering against his chest, the dry you. This time it is a conscious decision. He turns and leaps tumbling into the circle of protective boughs. Dark turns to light, and like is not like, he thinks, and blood is not destiny. Choices by Dana Fisher The two-acre pumpkin farm stretched hopelessly before him. His fifty minutes were nearly up, and the prize blue pumpkin still eluded him. Gary checked the digital watch the farm's proprietor had strapped on his wrist. Its display counted down remorselessly. You understand? The proprietor said. Gary nodded. I have fifty minutes to find the blue pumpkin. Find it, and the five million dollars is mine, free and clear. Fail? Gary shook his head, denying failure could be a possibility. He looked at Anna and their three kids waiting for him outside. She was still so pretty, but pale, worn to the bone. He worked three jobs. She worked one and took care of the kids. Debt still crushed them. Not the flashy, blue money on a yacht kind of debt. Daily debt. The type no one ever talked about. Debt that built over years just to feed them, buy toilet paper. No, failure wasn't an option. Gaze darting left, right, left, right, Gary crisscrossed the pumpkin patch. In all the orange, brown, and green, a blue pumpkin should have stood out. But he hadn't spotted it yet, and only minutes remained. He fought panic, kept searching. The proprietor was insistent. And if you fail, you understand the cost. I pay you one year for every minute of the fifty-minute search, Gary said. I'll walk off your farm fifty years older. But you have an out. Simply say aloud, stop, before your time runs out, and you'll lose nothing. But gain nothing either. The proprietor gestured to Gary's family. Think of them. Think of what you could do with them over that fifty years. Like what? Gary despaired. Watch them lose their home? Watch them teased at school for being so poor? Who was he kidding? Gary worked so many hours he almost never saw them anyway. What would change? The watch ticked towards the deadline. Less than thirty seconds left. He would have to say stop and let hope vanish. A flash of cobalt caught his eye. There, the blue pumpkin hid under a yellowed leaf twenty-five feet to his right. He checked the watch. Five seconds. Four. He could make it. He could. He ran. Here you go, the proprietor said, freshly harvested. Fifty years to add to your life. Mrs. Purita's arthritic fingers drew the offered pumpkin across the countertop. The deep blue color mesmerized her. Yes, this is perfect. Fifty years to live over. She sighed, gratefully. This time around, I will not waste those precious moments. That's what they all say, he said. His dismissive tone stiffened her resolve. She would make her second chance count. She passed him her credit card. Fifty years were worth any price. A woman paced outside by the farm gate, her kids playing nearby. She seemed so young, a lifetime of moments ahead. Mrs. Porida couldn't fathom why that family would be at a place like this. Are they here buying years as well? No, he said sadly. They're here to donate. The Corn Maze by Erica Damon The little girl stepped from the corn maze and immediately stood out. Her blonde hair bobbed around her dirt-stained face in a blunt cut, and her faded t-shirt hung off her shoulder. Everyone else was in a Halloween costume running through the maze. She stared at me. I was supposed to be the adult here, nearly twenty-five. I wasn't supposed to look the other way and label her a child of the corn in my head. There was no mistake. She was coming to me. Maybe she needed help? I crouched down, despite wanting to turn and pretend I didn't see. Do you need something? She stopped and looked back into the maze. Is my mom in there? 
Her voice was unexpectedly low. I don't know. What's her name? I was going to help. I was. What's your name? I tried again to get an answer from her, but she only repeated her question. I had to answer. I'm Marie. Can you tell me your name? She watched me through wide, almost wild eyes. Marie is my mom's name. The coincidence gave me goosebumps. I tried to rub them away. Okay, let's go ask someone. I offered my hand as I scanned around for someone in charge. No, you can be my mom. She tugged my hand and stepped backwards towards the corn. You can be all our moms. My whole body was in goosebumps this time. What was that supposed to mean? I tried to ignore the crawling sensation under my skin. I was going to help. Maybe she's in here. Marie? I called out. A giggle bubbled from her throat. I called again. Marie! No answer. We twisted and turned through the maze. The stalks towered high and the sun low in the sky. The maze was empty. It was only me and her. Mom, now you can meet the others. She looked up at me, grinning. I tried to pull my hand from her, but hers had become a vice. Let go! I was done being the grown-up. My pulse pounded. She tugged harder. I pulled back again and was finally free. Spinning, I tore down the path. I was lost and now the sun was completely gone. Clouds plucked out the moon. Darkness. More turns. Mommy! A voice came from my right. Another ahead. I turned, but the voices came from everywhere. Hands reached out, wrapping around my wrists, pulling at my belt loops and tangling in the hem of my shirt. Mommy, stay with us, they chimed. There was a shuffle, a swish, and a different kind of darkness enveloped me. I don't know how long it was, but the next thing I saw was a sky full of stars. I was being dragged. The cornfield was gone. Yay, Mommy's awake! One voice from above me, then another. We're almost home. Daddy will be so happy. Sticks Pond by Caitlin Stewart Faint lullabies drifted from the boat on the pond. Grandpa? Black waters rippled. The cave looked the same as when he fished here as a child before Grandma went missing. He waded in halfway before a spurt of hot water forced him back to the shallows. Fisherman! Behind him waited the nightmares he hadn't believed in for more than thirty years. The tiny sylph and the pale man. I will burn you, fisherman, if you fail to name me ruler of the pond. Boiling water gushed from the lady's ears, darkening the dirt. Mortal, pale man said. My people require an impervious army to retake the earth. No, Sylph huffed. The pond will revive my sister. Grandma owns sticks. The fisherman calmed his erratic breathing. If he reached the boat, he would find Grandma. Grandma always knew how to quiet the nightmares. He needed time. Fight for it. Reasonable, pale man nodded to Sylph. Ready yourself. The lady screamed notes gathering water from the air into a boiling cube. While they fought, he ran. He hoisted himself onto the boat and started the motor, ignoring Grandma's old ferry pole. He lit the lantern and revved the boat into the cave, sensing Pale Man's smoke dissolving a puff of his hair and pillowing down his neck before wafting away. The cave's subsidian walls crawled ahead as far as he could see, as the water turned into a flowing river. Fairy woman? A voice growled from the darkness above. No, her fisherman grandson. Who's there? How can creatures so young look so old? Another voice boomed. Fisherman! Styx remains an overcrowded station until the fairy travels to the underworld again. But must it be you who claims her mantle? No. Shivers vibrated his body. Grandma owns sticks. If you grant us sticks, we see the tasty souls. We remove the glut. Teeth sliced into his back, carrying him up and up, away from the boat's light. He will abdicate his position to me, 
Sylph's voice rang. The creature above him shuddered and bellowed on the rock face. Scalding water dripped onto him from its fur. The teeth rescinded, and he plummeted into the river. They watched him resurface. Sylph perched on a giant three-headed mastiff. Name me. Pale man stood on the water's surface. Declare me ruler. It's always been grandma's. He shut his eyes. Boiling water splashed his sliced back as he treaded water. He cried out, You will never see your grandmother again if you fail to name me. If they didn't need him for some reason, they would have killed him already. If the pond could have saved Sylph's sister, then it could help him see his grandma. If they wanted it, he wanted it. If his word meant something, then the pond is mine. I inherited it and everything in it. He saw the dead who had always been in his boat. Grandma, I missed you. My little fisherman became a ferryman. Let us go to our last fishing trip. Never Alone by Melanie Drake Charles Fry counted to a hundred silently, surrounded by whispers and rustles and the scent of dried leaves. He reached one hundred and removed the blindfold. He stood alone in the midst of dead cornstalks in the windless, chilly night. A brother was never alone. They always pledged together. Yet he stood utterly alone in this corn maze. That must be the key. The others had to be in here, too. They needed to find each other and escape together. No brother left behind. He let the blindfold fall to the ground and picked a direction. This would be easy. Little kids did this every fall. He turned right at every opportunity, calling his brother's names. No one replied, and he stopped abruptly as he rounded another right turn. His blindfold puddled on the dirt in the bright starlight. His heart quickened, and he tried left turns, but again ended back at his blindfold, still alone. He shivered. Halloween. Fish, you're letting your nerves get to you. He scolded himself. He picked up the blindfold and set off again, turning randomly, walking quickly. His skin felt clammy, and his voice, calling names, had become shrill. How big was this stupid maze, and where were his pledge brothers? Though the corn was undisturbed, the blindfold he'd tucked in a belt loop stirred and caressed his hand. Trust us, said whispers from the corn. Sweat soaked his shirt, and he burst into a run, yelling wildly. He finally stopped, gasping for air. Trust, the whispers said. I don't believe in ghosts, and if I did, why should I trust you? It had to be either the elders hazing him, in which he needed to trust them, or a rival fraternity misleading him. Trust us. One voice was clear and recognizable, and his sweat-soaked shirt felt like ice. Or ghosts, of course. Every fraternity house had its story. Theirs was the doctor owner from a century and a half ago, rumored to have killed his malformed sons and buried them in the backyard. Stories, that was all. But he remembered this voice. He and several others had heard it one night from the speakers in the space between two songs, on the old vinyl record, never to be reproduced. He shuddered. Get a grip, fish. Put the blindfold on whispered the corn. Friends or foes? Hell. He donned the blindfold and followed the voice's instructions to find his pledge brothers, one by one. Wondering what he was leading them to, he persuaded them to blindfold themselves and follow him and the voices through the corn. Remove your blindfolds and see where trusting your brothers takes you. He recognized the fraternity president's voice with relief. Fish removed his blindfold and saw the current fraternity brothers standing at the maze's entrance in front of the pledges, and hundreds of ghostly figures lining the dark country road, applauding silently, wearing clothes from a dozen decades past. Fish grinned. A brother is never alone. 
School Dance by Michael F. Swan. Go on, Bobby, Josh said. Leanne really wants you to take her to the Halloween dance. She's waiting for you around the corner in the back hall. Leanne, stammered Bobby, would you... Could I take you to the Halloween dance? Leanne smiled, gazing at him with her warm brown eyes. Bobby's heart pounded quickly against the confines of his ribcage as anticipation and hope coursed through his body. Of course I would. If you weren't such a dweeb, you worthless worm, I wouldn't be seen with you if you were the last boy at school. Bobby's face reddened with humiliation, and he fled, hoping that this would blow over quickly. Then the video surfaced, first on Facebook, then passed around on Snapchat, repeated on Twitter and Instagram, and finally posted on YouTube. This is really high quality H, said Dave the dropout. Only use one baggie. More than that, and you're never coming home. In the alley, under the dance hall balcony, Bobby injected both baggies into his arm. When they come out to vape, they'll see my body, and they'll know it's their fault. Odd. Bobby stood and looked. His hand was translucent, and through it, he saw his lifeless body by the dumpster. He drifted toward a dull red circle in the pavement. With an act of will, he forced himself to move away. Maybe later, he thought. I'm not done yet. The witch looked into the bathroom mirror, adjusting her makeup when Bobby floated through the wall. She screamed and ran. Cool, thought Bobby. They can see me. I'll teach them. Bobby took himself up to the ceiling floating above the chandeliers, looking for Leanne and Josh. He spotted them next to the open French doors to the balcony, talking to a small group of sparkly vampires and werewolves. And to think, that loser actually thought I might go with him. After this, maybe he'll leave us alone and go to a loser school, Leanne said. Bobby dived towards Josh and Leanne, opening his mouth in an overly wide, evil grin and howled at them. Leanne screamed and ran through the doors, followed by Josh. Leanne hit the balcony and started to tumble over. Josh grabbed her in a vain attempt to save her and both crashed into the alley. Having finished his revenge, Bobby relaxed and allowed the red circle to pull him down. An electric jolt hit his chest. Wait, ghosts can't feel pain. Again, it hit. Bobby opened his eyes and saw two EMTs hovering over him. He glanced to his left, and the unmoving crumpled bodies of Leanne and Josh. The lady EMT spoke, Damn, three suicides in one night. At least we were able to bring one of them back. They loaded Bobby onto the gurney, and as they put him in the ambulance, he looked up and saw Josh and Leanne staring at him in all their translucent glory. A Shaman Grows in Brooklyn by Annette Vendry's Leach. Zig held Sherry's hand tight, yanking it back and forth, a little too excited and one skittle away from Buck Wild. Seeing the Halloween parade with his mother, not his babysitter, was a dream come true. The perks of her unemployment. On a dark corner, Zig stopped short and pointed. Mom, look! The Grim Reapers! One of them heard Zig. Slithering on rollerblades, menacing in a white hockey mask and black hooded cape, wielding an eight-foot sickle in the air, the Grim Reaper skated up to Sherry and raised its blade over her head. She screamed. A princess and pirate dragging bags of candy laughed at her. Scaredy cat. Mom, that guy's not even the real Grim Reaper. Don't be morbid, Z. I'm not morbid. Halloween is when spirits come out to play when magic is the most powerful. Zig spread his arms about the crowd. Some of these may be costumes and some of them may not, he said, flashing his big front teeth. You can't scare me, Injun Joe. I scared all the teachers at school, he said, skipping ahead. Sherry reached for him, but he slipped away. Quoting the Twilight Zone was strange for a ten-year-old. And lately, he said bizarre things that kept her up at night. He made his costume from found feathers, pasted on a shredded t-shirt, 
a beaded headdress festooned with more feathers, added a walking stick from Prospect Park, and hand-sewn his moccasins that were too thin to wear on a cold night. Weird yet authentic, Zig bravely stood out against the neon superheroes and pink princesses that bounced by. He darted through the crowd under a clown on stilts and around a clan of witches. Wait up! she yelled. Zig's shoulders were hiked up to his ears. He was wheezing. She found him behind a fruit stand. It's not funny, Zig. If you don't listen to me, we're going home. The smirk fell off his face. He began to cough. Where's your inhaler? Zig's eyes glinted in the early evening light. He patted down his front pants pockets. Giggles spurt from his lips between coughs. He patted his back pockets. Uh, I left it in my backpack. What? I thought it was in my pocket. Zig sat on a fire hydrant, his cough building in intensity. He could have an asthma attack at any moment. Sherry squat down in front of Zig. Climb up on my back. We're going to the emergency room. Zig glanced around covertly. He couldn't bear to have any of his buddies see him on his mother's back. She hoisted his thin legs around her side, and he clasped his arms under her chin. His cough went deeper. As she felt his chest rise and fall rapidly against her spine, Zig whispered in her ear, I don't need to breathe to live. Zombie Walk by M. M. V. Hamilton Crowds of people did not intimidate Molly, so today nothing would deter her from her task. Sweet-natured as she was, her fundamental tenacity, which her breed aptly named, carried her through the throng. Her bowed legs shuffled across the grass, and she trailed a slivered strand of drool along the concrete. Even the girth of her bulldog body would not be restrained by the tangle of shuffling feet. She could smell her target, the tail thumping scent that somewhere in her primitive doggy brain meant pack and home. Through the distraction of caro-covered Doc Martens, the stumbling of red-stained chucks, she moved carrying her prize. How many do you think? Her ears picked up. Her master's voice threaded its way through the moans and groans of the crowd. And what is it with zombies? I don't get it. Why would anybody want a world record for walking like a zombie? Molly quickened her waddle, panting with the effort. It's not walking like one doofus. It's how many. Sheesh. You know, kids, anything to make a headline. Well, at least it's a bunch of walking dead people. Okay, so it's four packed downtown streets of walking dead people. But who's counting? You got that right. Hey, Peterson, isn't that Molly? A friendly voice, very friendly, but not hers, not her master's. Hey, girl, what are you doing here? She trotted as fast as her little legs would go, nails clicking on the asphalt. Looks like she's got someone's prop. These things, these pe... That's not a prop, Jack. Look, it's a hand, and it's dripping. Here, girl, let me have it. Molly dropped her prize at her master's feet, looking up with her big, watery eyes for the pat she knew he would give her. You are sure this is not somebody's idea of a gag, Jack? Maybe somebody out there. Her master moved his hand around, and she danced in a circle for him. Somebody's having us on? She waited for her good girl, tongue lolling, smiling her best good doggy smile. What's that in her teeth, Peterson? A medic alert brace... Molly? She dipped her head. She knew that tune. It was his you-did-a-bad-thing tone. She looked up one more time before turning and running, losing herself in the crowd of sounds and smells, running for home. Molly! The Seeds of Horror by Charles Hoag The sun laid low in the sky, dusk pushing it down trying to drown it in an ocean of black, inky clouds. The wind shrieked through bare and craggy tree limbs as they swayed like zombies teetering on rotting limbs. A tall, thin house sat at the end of a long street. Only one light visible from the outside shined through the cobwebbed window, 
forcing shadows from tombstones in the front yard to spill out like demons banished from a human host. Inside, Jack sat cold and unassuming with a blank expression. The kitchen light flickered. Without warning, a figure came from behind. In the next moment, Jack was involuntarily grabbed and spun around to face the oncoming attacker. Jack never had a chance. The large knife glinting with the last vestiges of light from the nearly dead sun found its mark. Jack made no sound as if silenced from immeasurable fear while the blade repeated its onslaught over and over again. Fluids dripped out like a beer tap pulled, guts landing here and there as they were torn from Jack. Some laid to rest with morbid care and others were shaken from the attacker's hands with warrant disregard. Jack's once expressionless face was now that of absolute anguish and horror. Should anyone look upon it, their bones would shake and screams would burst from their lips like pus from a squeezed pimple on a witch's chin. Life ebbing, Jack felt the warmth of a great light. It filled Jack completely. Was this how it was in the final moments? A warm and lasting light to whisk Jack off to the great beyond? Jack floated through the air, held aloft in the hands of a beautiful angel. Jack basked in the light and rejoiced until finally being set down and left alone on a tall spire. Such an evil trick. Confused, all Jack could do was sit there. When next, nothing could prepare Jack for the incomprehensible monstrosity approaching. He who should not be named, the Devil Incarnate, stood menacingly. Ding dong! Susie ran to the front door, her angel wings fluttering behind her. She peeked through the side window, and standing outside, a devilish character stood. Mom, Robbie's here. I'm leaving for the party. Her mother met her at the front door and greeted Robbie with a smile. Have a good time, guys, and please be careful. Running down the porch stairs, Robbie turned, his devil's tail whipping about. Hey, Mrs. G, great pumpkin, he exclaimed. Thank you. His name is Jack. Happy Halloween. And that is our Halloween special, Listener Edition, Part 1. Don't forget to check out Part 2, coming out on Halloween itself.